thank you so much, Beetle, uh, for coming on. We greatly appreciate having you on here and uh, rescheduling with us, you know, for, you know, for, for this episode for this week. So we appreciate you. Yeah. Yeah. Pro Fan Sports Podcast. Let's get it. Pro Fan. Pro Fan. Tune into the program. Every single week, get the dope fam. Sean on the mic, very flat too. Keep you updated, that's what we do. Pro Fan. Tune into the program. Pro Fan. Tune into the program. Pro Fan. Tune into the program. Every single week, get the dope fam. Yo, 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 what to do, everybody? It's your boy, John Altador, with Pro Fan Sports Podcast, where the fans of the pros go back at you with my boys, Vlad. Barry's going to come in in a minute if he can. And um, someone you hear daily on your radio, 98.5, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on a daily basis on the weekdays. It's Martin Bertrand, a.k.a. Beetle. How you doing, Beetle? Great. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you for coming on, man. It's, it's awesome to have you on. And, um, you know, I listen to you while I'm driving, you know, in the work every day. And then, you know, throw the app on, 98.5 on, you know, on the, on the AirPods. You know, I'm, I'm in there. So thanks for coming on for sure. I tap that app, as I like to say, for yep. 98.5, the Sports Hub. And also the stream is the unedited version of the show. When someone swears or Zoe says something completely insane, it never gets dropped on the stream. You get the full show there. <laughs> on on 98.5? Yes. So, so when there's... Not the radio? It's a little different because if someone, you know, decides in the middle of their call that they want to say, you know, uh, that Belichick's an idiot, you know, he's an asshole. On the radio, you don't get that because yeah. it gets dropped. And then all yeah. of a sudden it just sort of skips because we've got a delay. And they hit the delay button. But on the stream, you get all the swears. You That's get all uncut yeah. version of the show. <laughs> See, you usually I'm on the app, so you know I, I don't really get the the radio stuff. But you know, yeah. um, your show is great with Zolak for sure. Yeah, I've been I've been a fan of yours, Beetle, since the days of the Fugger and Maz show when you used to do the update for them. Um, I've been a fan since then. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's been uh, almost. Let's see, this will be uh, 13 years. This year, since the sports have started, and yeah, you've been there since then, day one. Oh wow! Yeah, I'm, one of the, awesome. I'm one of the original employees of the sports hub from the summer of 2009. So this this summer will be our third. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we will have, we'll celebrate our 13th birthday this summer. Awesome! Before we start talking about sports, how annoying is it when Zolak talks about something random in the middle of a sports conversation? <laughs> In the middle of the conversation, it's the worst. It's, it's better when it, like, starts the segment and it, you just sort of get to it. And so, let's be honest. I mean, sometimes Zoe uh, is not talking about sports and it's absolutely hysterical. And it's oh, fun, yeah, oh, yeah. Right? I mean, there's those things. It's just I like to do it at the start of the segment. Like, okay, let's you do whatever it is you need to do and talk about whatever it is you need to talk about, and then we'll move on to the sports things. When you drops it right in the middle of the conversation and we're trying to do something, that's when it's a little annoying. Like, hey, wait, wait, hey, over here. Refocus. Refocus. We're talking about, you know, talking about Mac Jones or we're talking about the Bills this weekend. Ah, 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 hey, hey, you right here, you know? It's like, and it's usually, it's usually something about lunch. Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like four or five different things. It's about food. It's about something he sees on the TV in the studio. Yeah. So no, those are the ones he drops right in the middle of the conversation. And he'll be like, oh, and you're like, what? And you're like, did you just see that on the news? And I'm like, no, I wasn't watching the news. I was doing the show. You know? Like, I'm trying to do my that? job. <laughs> like, oh, did you just see that? You know, or the other thing that he likes to do, and we've talked about this on the air before, he likes to watch uh, pimple popping videos. So, like, oh, wow. Zoe was in, you know, everyone's seen Dr. Pimple Popper by now. Zoe was into those videos long before that show ever existed. Oh like my he God. will go on YouTube and will search for cysts getting popped and cut <laughs> open and like pimples and just the most disgusting videos that he watches. And when he's on the end, 
you know, we've had to shuffle our seats a little bit with COVID and try and separate people as much as we can. And when he's sitting on the end, which is where Hardy normally sits, that last seat, that computer screen is in full view of the producers. And there will be times where I look over and I'm like, what's so doing? You know, he's not really paying attention. And I just see the faces of the producers just like, oh, like, <laughs> and I know what he's doing. I know that he's watching pimple popping videos over there. So, you know, sometimes you just got to get him refocused. That's all. It's always special. It's always special. <laughs> he is. He is I'm, in a lot of ways. <laughs> I, I can't I can't stomach those videos myself, man. I, I don't, don't put those things around me, man. <laughs> oh, he loves them. It's so gross. So gross. Oh. Are you doing some stuff on TV too? Um, you know, I, I, I like have like things that I do sometimes. I, I used to do a lot of TV. I used to be on Comcast pretty regularly. Yeah. I would do, you know, we had early edition and the 10 o'clock show, which used to be called, what did it used to be called? Now I can't even remember what the name of it was. But we used to have the 10 o'clock show before they call it BST now, and Felger and Holly. I used to do either six o'clock or 10 o'clock shows, but they've sort of scaled back on that. Um, so I haven't done as much of that. And I do channel seven on Sunday nights every now and again. I used to do other shows on Comcast that I don't really do because they don't exist anymore. Uh, quick, uh, not quick slides. What do we do? Football fix was on yep. for a while. We used to do a baseball show every now and again. It's th that work is sort of drying up on the local level. The, yep. The, you know, the regional sports now, and we're lucky because in this town, we do have two regional sports stations in Nesson and in NBC Sports Boston. They both do have local shows, uh, not just our simulcasts, but like local in-studio shows. That, that's not taking place in a lot of markets now. That yeah. sort of, those jobs are, are sort of disappearing. So I don't do as much of it anymore, but from time to time, I'll, I'll do an appearance on a show. Yeah, I mean, we love you on the radio anyway, so it is what it is. That's the bread and butter right there. I mean, that's what yeah. I always wanted to do anyway. And so, you know, that's that's my real job every day on the radio. Absolutely, man. 10 a.m., 2 p.m. And you're Mark underscore Bertrand on Twitter, right? Yep, Mark with a C is what it is, underscore Mark Bertrand. Bertrand. Make sure you guys are following Mark Bertrand, man. He got some really good stuff out there, good content, and Obviously, with Zolak, you know, there's never a dull moment, man, you know. Um, so so let, let's get on to, to discussing some, some sports, man. We're on to the playoffs, right, with the Patriots. Um, seems like we're, we're backing up into this, the playoffs, right, with the loss to Miami. And since then, Miami's taken a loss themselves, right, with uh, the firing of Brian Flores. can't believe that. I can't believe that they fired him after – three decent years there and it's it sounds like it's personal right yeah. and I don't know I don't know if that's good or bad because I would I, I almost feel like it's better that it's personal because at least there's some sort of explanation right where you have two guys you know in Chris Greer who's their GM and in Brian Flores maybe they just didn't get along maybe they don't see eye to eye maybe they're pissed at each other about who wanted Tua and who didn't want Tua at least that will give you some sort of like okay Two people can't function together. They can't work together. And it's creating a bad sort of environment and culture in the building. Like that, I can sort of understand. Not to say it's right or his firing was justified. But if they just think that based on his job performance, he deserved to get fired, uh, that's complete bull crap. Because yeah. that's absolutely not the case with Brian Flores. That team was a 10-win team last year, 9-win team this year. You know, one game separated them and the Patriots in the AFC East. They're one game apart record-wise. <laughs> and I don't think that he's got uh, really the quarterback that they're going to, you know, have their beef, have their franchise guy. I don't think they have that guy right now. I said it today. You flip their quarterbacks. If you give them Mac Jones right now, I think that they're in the playoffs with 10 wins and the Patriots are on the other side with nine wins. Mm. I think Mac Jones is worth a win, a win right now over yeah. a guy who's like sort of similar to him, but I don't think he's good. Uh, I think two is fine. You know, he's the type of guy that starts for a few years and then sort of peters out. But I think Mac Jones has more potential. And I think that if you flip those guys year one this year, the Dolphins are in and the Patriots are not. Quick, quick follow-up question on that. 
does does that hurt their chance of getting Deshaun, Deshaun Watson? I think it does because Deshaun Watson really wanted to go there because of Brian Flores. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, and so I think – and don't forget, Deshaun Watson's got the ability to veto deals, and he can say no. And so I don't know that he's still going to want to go to Miami, although I don't think he's in a great position right now himself in terms of, you know, choosing his next destination. I think if there's a team that really wants him and it's a good team, he should probably say yes to it. And, you know, if there's a team that wants to welcome him with open arms and have him be their franchise quarterback, he's probably going to want to take that opportunity. Take all his other off-the-field stuff out of it because, you know, that's something he's got to deal with anyway. But his owner in Houston, Cal McNair is the owner there. You know, according to the people that know him, he, he doesn't want anything to do with Deshaun Watson. And it's not just because of the, the, the troubles he has off the field. It's because he doesn't like that the guy was asking for a trade or mm-hmm. wanted to be out of there before all of this happened. He hated that. He doesn't like that about him. And he wants to move on simply because going back to last offseason, he said he didn't want to be there anymore. So he's done with him. He doesn't want him there anymore. So I don't think there's a chance for him to stay in Houston. He's going to have to find a team. But Brian Flores is a guy that I think some players really like. And, you know, you've heard whispers, maybe some reports today that there are other players that uh, didn't love playing for him. But I think that's true about every coach. I think right. every coach has his fans and has the guys who love him and the guys who hate him. You know, and I'm sure that's true of Bill Belichick, which I'm sure you've heard guys complain about him over the years. You know, any other coach, Pete Carroll, Bill Parcells, whoever. His best – Bill Belichick's best player left because he just didn't want to play for him anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a long – I mean, whether it's Brady playing for him for 20 years or Gronk for a decade, you know, I mean, it happens. But, yeah, so I, I was stunned. I mean, stunned in that he didn't deserve to lose his job. He definitely didn't. There are guys that certainly deserve to get fired. Joe Judge. Oh, like Joe Judge, Judge, right? I would have fired that guy six weeks ago. (laughs) What a clown. That guy's a clown. I mean, look at Joe Judge and look at Brian Flores and tell me which guy's an NFL head coach. It's it's a no-brainer, right? It's Brian Flores. And so uh, I'm I'm just stunned that Joe Judge gets to keep his job and Brian Flores doesn't because that just doesn't seem fair. It really doesn't. So I agree. I, I think mean, he's going to get another job as soon as possible. I think there's going to be another team that's going to want to hire him right now. Oh, I, th- I thought he'd have a job by the end of the business day today. Because, I mean, to me, yeah. I don't think anybody was ready to, you know, I don't think anybody thought that Brian Flores would be out of a job come this morning. What, what is he, four and two against the Patriots since he's been there? Yep. Like, what, what, four wins. What, what more do you want? You know, like you're, you're beating, you know, a team in a division that – all these teams want to, you know, win against, and you you fire that guy. So um, that was definitely very surprising. But, you know, as we all can see, he's a great coach, and he's going to end up somewhere pretty soon, you know. Um, but on, on to the Patriots, man. So we lose to Miami Dolphins, and we saw what happened last night with uh, the Chargers and the Raiders. So now, you know, we're slated to to have Bills and, and Pats three for the season. Um, what are your thoughts on that? What, what, what's happening? Yeah, I like I like that it's the team that they know really well. So I, I said this before I knew who they'd play. I, I was in the camp of rooting for playing the Bills and getting that third matchup. And I know there are a lot of people that disagree with that and say you should have rooted for Cincinnati and Joe Burrow and a young quarterback against Bill Belichick. I just think Buffalo's a better opportunity on a short week to know exactly who it is you're dealing with when you go there, right? And the Patriots have had some sort of hint that they'd be rematched with Buffalo for weeks now. So I think it's likely that the Patriots, maybe quietly, not not with coaches telling the players, but the coaching staff and scouting staff has quietly been reviewing their two matchups and really that second matchup that happened on the 26th back at Gillette Stadium. They've been reviewing that and working on the game plan for – for Patriots Bills number three. And I think the matchup against the Bengals, despite their problems up front in protecting Joe Burrow, I think the Bengals can throw the football. I think they can move the ball through the air. And I think that right now, Patriots defense is having a hard time covering guys. Maybe the bigger concern is how many yards they're giving up on the ground. So in my opinion, you go up against Buffalo, you know who the guy is you got to take away and that's Diggs. And you're going up against a team that doesn't run the ball particularly well. 
and doesn't really try to run the ball particularly well and is sort of one-dimensional, and the offense is all predicated on Josh Allen. And the game that the Bills played here on the 26th, the day after Christmas, that was all Josh Allen. Those are the yeah. best games of his career. And I just think if you play the odds, is Josh Allen going to have another game like that one in the elements this time? Looks like it's going to be cold and a little bit of wind, little bit of wind again in Buffalo. Is he going to play that same level of game a second time in the same season against the Patriots? I mean, that was a top three type of performance of his entire career, what he did in Foxborough. And he didn't turn the ball over, and the Patriots had their chances. J.C. Jackson had a chance. You know how easy of a catch that is. We can debate. But they, they didn't turn the ball over, and he played great. I don't know that he can do that again. I don't know if he can play that same game. And so I, I just like sort of rolling the dice, and it's the devil you know with the Buffalo Bills. So I think that there's uh, no excuse on the short week. It's a team you know really well. It's a team that, you know, you can game plan for. And I think, I think the Patriots at this point in time are facing an uphill battle anyway. They've got injuries all of a sudden that have popped up, and we don't know the full impact of those right now. But they also have so many mistakes, and they've shot themselves in the foot against good teams the last month. That's why they lost three games. That wasn't by mistake that they lost three of their last four with their only win being against Jacksonville. So I think the bigger issue in the matchup this week is the Patriots cleaning up their own problems, eliminating those mistakes, eliminating those penalties, playing a more disciplined game, uh, winning the game in the trenches up front, I think, especially on offense. Those are going to be all the things that's going to decide whether or not the Patriots are going to win a playoff game. So you think the defense is going to be able to get the Bills to punt at least one time this game? Man, I would hope so. <laughs> I would hope so. Because uh, watching that play out, I mean, that had never happened to yes. Bill Belichick. Yeah. Never. That's a lot nope. of games. A lot of games to never oh, have yeah. that happen. So, yeah, I think, I think uh, with the third matchup and another chance to see those guys, they're going to have to force them to punt at least, at least a couple of times. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I was on the camp for, for the Bills as well. Just because I feel like, you know, if, if you're going to get through, you got to get through the best, you know, opponent you can, you know. And I, I feel like that, that makes your team stronger anyway, you know. That, that boosts your confidence and, you know, you're not backing up into anything, you know, where you're facing weak opponents and then, you know, boom, you know, AFC championships or whatever. You can't really do nothing against a really good team. So um, I think this this game, you know, I don't know. I, I'm thinking about Mac Jones. You know, do you think – how do you think he'll hold up? You know, because cause last, last game, they – I feel like, you know, the league's kind of got Max number as of late. Yeah, I mean, I, I question today is he sort of hitting a rookie wall a little bit, and I do think that's a little bit a part of it, and I think that this is a long season, and it's longer than it's ever been before in the NFL. And so that's, you know, could be part of it. He's making mental mistakes – that I, I think he should be over at this point in time. I think he made a mental mistake on the pick. He obviously made a mistake losing the football. I mean, I, I think that there are things to look at in that game yesterday and say he should be over this at this point. But I also think, to some degree, he doesn't have great guys to throw to. And I know the tight ends, you know, were big ticket items. And, and Hunter Henry had a big catch yesterday. And Hunter Henry's been really good, but I think that they lack speed overall in this offense. Uh, and I've been saying it for a few mm -hmm. months now. That they just – they need someone that is capable of getting open almost every play. You know, they need that guy. They need that elite talent. They need that guy who can move. And so they, they need a defense to also key in on somebody. There's no offensive weapon that Mac Jones can throw to that sets coverage – and that defenses go into a game and say, we've got to take this guy away. If we take that, you know, it's the, how Bill Belichick approaches it when they face other teams. When they're facing Buffalo this week, they want to make sure they do their best to try and take Stephon Diggs away. When they're playing, uh, name a team and name a, a weapon. You know, I mean, there's so many times where they go into a game and say, well, if we take this player away, we, we're going to make them beat us a different way. Who, who is that for the Patriots? Who are the Bills looking at? within the Patriots offense saying, ooh, we got to take this guy away. And if you're going to tell me it's the running backs, I'd say, yeah, that proves the point, that there's no guy that Mac can throw to that other defenses really have to focus in on and game plan around. That guy doesn't exist. And all you have to do is add one. You just add one of those guys, 
And I think mm -hmm. it changes quite a bit. And I think you've started to open some other things up. I think, you know, Johnny Smith year two is going to be better. I'm not, yeah. I'm not down. Uh, everyone's down on that guy right now. I, I just think they've used him so differently than any other way he's been used in his career that there's an adjustment period. So I think next year you might see a different Janu Smith. And I would just like to see more playing time for Kendrick Bourne. I think there's really something there. And I think he's really, you know, he could be a really nice complimentary player behind whoever that like number one sort of really elite sort of pass catcher is. But that's not going to help him this weekend because that's not going to change, you know? So right. I, I think, I think Max is going to clean up some of those mental things uh, whether it be the false start or the pick or anything else that's gone on, you know, in terms of where he, where he is going with the football. But uh, I, I think that it's really at times maybe trusting Jacoby Myers too much, mm -hmm. really trying to force the ball to him because it's a guy that he trusts, and I don't blame him for that. Of all the guys that he's got to throw to, I would trust Jacoby Myers the most too. So mm -hmm. I don't know that everyone's got Mac figured out, but I think that uh, – well, he could use some some better guys around him, and we'll we'll see how it goes. Yeah, flat. Well, yeah. No, I actually was going to mention Myers. I was going to say Myers is probably the closest thing that he has to a dependable or somebody he has a very strong connection to. Um, if so, if a team wants to double Myers, maybe that can um, force him to throw to other people. Yeah. yeah, I just I, I also don't think yeah. Myers is a guy that demands that. Like, you know, Myers is not – he's a good player. He's a solid yeah. player, but he's he's not elite. And I don't think he – I don't – as a defense, I don't think you're going to commit more than, you know, a player to cover him. Mm -hmm. He's not super fast. You know, he's yeah. got good hands. He's reliable. You can sort of trust him in a key third down spot. And I think that may have been what sort of burned Mac Jones on, on the pick yesterday. He was looking to try and get the ball to Myers. I – Bilo, you, you, you mentioned um, Mike Jones having to clean up some of his mistakes, and I completely agree. But how strange is it for Bill Belichick team to be making so many mistakes, not just from a rookie quarterback standpoint, but from a specialty, special team standpoint? That's, I mean, I've been asking this all year. I just, I just don't understand what I'm watching sometimes. I, I, I feel as though I'm watching – another regular team from the league, not a Bill Belichick's coach team, which I understand you have a rookie quarterback and he's making rookie mistakes, but you, you, you're still, it's still a Bill Belichick coach team. So some of those mistakes on the defensive side or the special team is just unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that someone has to probably pay a price for, for, for what it is that's gone on on special teams. And... You know, I said today, Cam Accord, he's been the special teams coach for the last two seasons, and I don't think it's going very well. Mm. You know, I, I mean, I, I think that that's a guy who could potentially get held accountable at the end of this season. It's been, the special teams issues have been, in a Bill Belichick, you know, way of grading it, completely unacceptable. Bill, Bill's a guy who prides, you know, this, this is why you're asking that question. It's what you're saying. He prides himself on that. Yeah. You know, he started out as a special teams yeah. guy. Mm -hmm. So he's got all yeah. this, you know – He's got all those warm and fuzzies in his heart for special teams. It's something he just – he sweats special teams, which the rest of us, you know, we care about special teams when someone screws something up. Yeah. The rest of the time, I don't care about punts right. or kickoffs. I don't care about any of that. You know, I'm, my, uh, my buddy Mike Felger likes to say, do special teams on your own time, <laughs> he likes to say. You know, like the only, the only time special teams matters is when someone screws something up. It's like offensive line, right? You know, offensive line, you don't give them a lot of thought. Unless you're not too hard. Right? It's like, yeah, and the only time you want to really care about that, unless you're Greg Bedard or unless you're someone who really enjoys watching line play, you think about that when they're screwing things up. When they're having a good day, you say, oh, good day for the offensive line. And that's it. <laughs> you know? It's not <laughs> something you spend a ton of time on. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I Listen. A lot of it comes down to coaching. That was horrific, what happened yesterday with, with the penalty they took for lining up over the center. I thought when they oh, took wow, the Oh, wow, yeah. Lawrence Guy, <laughs> right? That was Lawrence Guy. That, that was that Lawrence Guy. Yep. Yep. The Lawrence Guy. The... Like, well, that's unacceptable. And where was yep. – um, how come there wasn't somebody – because usually I, I usually see Slater telling the guys to he'll move. walk up and he'll, he'll move him. Where was he that guy? He never moved him. 
I Nobody I called know. timeout either. I don't know. That was that, I, just, I don't I, I just I don't think that that would have happened in another year. And they're just I, I don't know what it is. I mean, there's something going on there that they're not paying close enough attention to the details. And in this league, paying attention to the details is what separates winners and losers sometimes. You know, and that's the thing. That's the thing that the Patriots have always gotten by on. Yeah. That they're always going to be yeah. better prepared, better coached, situational football, not to use a Bill Belichick cliche, but situational football and paying attention to those details. And this team at times has looked like a team that is so far from that and so far removed from what we've just sort of become accustomed to watching the last two decades. Absolutely. No, it sure has. Um, yeah, we wanted to ask you, I know we've talked about, you know, the offense a lot and how, you know, they, you know, could match the Bills up. We saw that the defense did struggle when they played him in that second matchup, uh, you know, on December 26th in Foxborough. Uh, what do they need to do defensively from, you know, from a standpoint to be able to really uh, make Josh Allen struggle and make him make those mistakes? And how can they get some of their key defensive guys like him at Judon's, um, you know, going more, more involved when they haven't really been – um, a, a factor in, you know, in these last few games. Yeah, so I, I think one of the big things that was a takeaway of that first matchup, in fact, we were just talking about this earlier today on the show, and it's something we've been sort of harping on since that game, the pressure rate, the pressure statistics that are out there now say that, say that Josh Allen were, was pressured on 44 or 45% of the snaps in that game which if you watch that game, it did not feel like Josh Allen was pressured nearly half the time, which tells you that some of the stats and analytics on that front are bull crap. And they, he wasn't pressured. And, and here's the thing, I, you know, going into that game, uh, I remember talking with Phil Perry, NBC Sports Boston, talking with Phil in our pregame that day of the game. And we talked about what we like to call the crush rush, which is forcing Josh Allen – to stay in the pocket and make throws. Because Josh Allen can run, man. That guy has a ton oh, yeah. of yards. Uh, he is, you know, I, I, statistically, I think, he's, I think he's rushed for more yards in the last three years than any other quarterback in the league. That includes Lamar Jackson, who everyone automatically thinks of this great runner, because he is. But Josh Allen has accounted for so much of their offense in Buffalo that he's run all over the place. And so, oh, you don't want to let him get out of the pocket. You want to force him to stay in the pocket and make throws. And, and I, you know, Phil and I agreed on this. After about the first quarter and a half of that game, I thought to myself, that is not going to work here today. They've got to get after this guy. They've got to force him not to stay in the pocket. They've got to force him to make the decision. Are you going to throw the ball or are you going to run? And so mm -hmm. I, I think they got to right. get after him. And, and what they really got to do is speed him up. That's what I think they got to do. And, you know, I, I don't think that the Patriots in coverage are, are very good at the moment. Uh, they've obviously suffered some injuries there this year, you know, and they, they have made do with the guys that they've got. And they're obviously dealing with another injury with Duggar, who didn't play yesterday. But I think they got to find a way to get after the quarterback. And so that to me would be the most important thing is, is maybe letting Matthew Judon pin his ears back and go. And, and be less concerned with, you know, setting the edge, which he hasn't done a great job of doing anyway in the run game, and sort of just getting after Josh Allen and trying to make him make decisions. Have him make a decision to run. Have him make a decision to throw. Have it happen fast. Because when it happens fast, that's when the mistakes happen. That's when the turnovers happen. That's when the picks happen. And I think maybe in addition to that, you've, you've got a guy who spies Josh Allen. You commit a defender to Josh Allen. He's leaving the pocket. I'm there with him. I'm after him, and I'm going to minimize the yardage that he picks up. And he's a big boy, so you could have someone who can really tackle. And I think of someone like Adrian Phillips, who plays much bigger than his actual size. I mean, I love that guy. He is a just – I mean, he's football crazy, as I like to say. Whereas, you know, he, he, he checks any sort of self-preservation at the door and just plays all out. So maybe that's what they consider doing. They, they put a defender – they assign him and spy the quarterback, 
and they, they try and get more pressure on Josh Allen. The kind of pressure where you're either going to get a sack or a bad decision or he's going to take off and run, but you've got him covered. Focus on him. That's what I would say. You know, for, forget Diggs for the time being. Put J.C. Jackson on Diggs and say, do the best job you can do. And Diggs has torched him, by the way. Yeah. J.C. Jackson has his kryptonite oh, yeah. in Stephon Diggs. Oh, yeah. It's a guy that just beats the back out of him. But he's still yeah. J.C. Jackson, and he's still your top corner. You give him that assignment, you see where it goes. Wow. So you're okay with that man coverage one-on-one -on -one and not really having a McCourty or another safety? You know, oh, no. Over, over oh, no. Top. I'm giving him the help over the top. Yeah. No, <laughs> no I'm going to give him that help <laughs> over the top for sure. Uh, you can't go without that. And – the, the Patriots, you know, if you're talking about the entire secondary, they've been they've been unable to play zone. I mean, excuse me, play man. Please. They've played so much zone this year because it's what they're capable of doing. And I just, you know, I think it's one of the sort of downfalls of the defense. Uh, I don't want them in a lot of straight-up man, one-on-one -on -one situations. Right. And I think in that first matchup, well, not the first matchup, the second matchup, excuse me, they did play a lot of zone coverage, and it was kind of like, a soft zone where they were given, you know, these guys a cushion and they're able to find the holes in the zone or, you know, be able to get to the, you know, spots in the areas that they wanted to. And that's how, you know, Josh Allen was able to pick them apart because guys were getting so open because, you know, the coverage was, you know, so soft in, in the zone. So, um, you know, de definitely I think that, um, you know, like, like you said, mixing up the coverages and, and, and certainly not playing a, a lot of zone or getting yeah, too much zone would certainly help with that. I also think the linebackers have to step up too as well. Like your yeah, Dante Hightowers who stepped up in big playoff games. Yeah, you know, Kyle Noise, Yeah, you know, even Jamie Collins, Josh Uche, who I want to see play more, um, you, you know, and stuff. I think even maybe Juwan Bentley, like I – I think those are the guys that really have to step up, and I kind of feel concerned because, um, you know, their main linebackers, the top three in Benoit, Hightower, and Collins, haven't really played too well, and I kind of trying to show their age and, they, you know, and, yeah. and, and really haven't been as much fact as we, you know, saw in the beginning of the season. I think they need more out of Benoit right now, and I think that, you know, the idea of putting – uh, Hightower at the line of scrimmage and standing him up and, and maybe letting him get free after Allen in this game is not a bad idea. And that would obviously introduce a little more playing time for Josh Uche. And I'd like to see what Josh Uche has, man. I feel like, you know, he's yeah. battled injuries again this year. So it hasn't been the easiest of years. He had that, you know, that three-game stretch he was out. But I don't know. I think it's time to find out if he can play. It's the end of year two. I think there's a lot of uh, potential there. Maybe this is the week he, he continues to sort of ramp up those snaps. Yeah, I mean, speaking yeah, of definitely. defense, um, you know, last series against Miami, we saw uh, Christian Barmar go down. Um, how, how big of a loss would Christian Barmar be if he couldn't go against the Bills next week? Yeah, so I did see this afternoon that MRI was clear, thankfully. Yeah. Uh, Zoe seemed to think that there Thank was God. a chance he didn't play this week, so – you know, I think we'll find it. We'll get a better understanding of that the next couple of days. Fergo was saying that too. Fergo was saying um, there, there's a high chance that he won't play. Wow. Yeah, I don't. I don't know where. He's at. Wow. You know, I don't. I, don't, I know that Zoe sort of said the attitude of some of the guys in the locker room after the game was was that he was you know potentially pretty hurt mm -hmm. and wasn't going to be able to go. But you know, listen, five days is five days. He could be in a different spot at the end of the week. And uh, I just think his tenacity and his ability has been – it's been such a great pick for them with Barmore. And, I mean, I look at their defensive oh, yeah. line. I, I, you look at their defensive lineman. You make the case he's their best defensive lineman as a rookie. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I think no so. Question. I mean, Absolutely. Without yeah, a so, you know, I, no disrespect to any of the other veterans up front, but – I think he's their best defensive lineman. He's dead. He's certainly the most destructive. He's certainly the most uh, – he's the guy who's quick to draw a, a double team. So, I mean, <laughs> then, I, then I, I just think – This year, I think in one game he put four guys on Barmore. Yeah. Woo! yeah so, That's crazy. Wow. Four? 
yeah. a game like this, if you want to get after the quarterback, you want him drawn blockers. So uh, that, that to me would not be a good thing for the Patriots. At least it wouldn't be uh, uh, against a team that can really run the ball well because the Bills don't do that. So, yeah, that would be a big loss. I'm hoping that's not the case. Yeah. I mean, um, Mark, we, we don't have you for I two. so, too. Yeah, we don't, we don't have you for too much longer. I think we just uh, hit the 30-minute mark. Um, you know, but what, what do we have to do to, to come out with a victory? Because I know, you know, Mac is a rookie. He's taking us in into this game, and not many rookies win their first playoff game. You know, what do we have to do to, to secure a W on, on Saturday? Can't get behind. It's I mean, really, they cannot afford to get behind, and this has become – uh, trend with this team <laughs> when the Patriots have have uh, not scored in the first quarter this year they're they're two and six I think is the record um, they just they got to get out to a better start their their starts against the three losses that they've had Indy Buffalo the start again this past weekend uh, just brutal starts in fact I would consider if I'm Bill Belichick and, and this sort of goes back to something that I, we saw in the game yesterday, which is on the fourth and one decision of the 50. And they decided to try and draw off, uh, draw them off sides instead of actually oh, so bad. for it. Oh, my oh. goodness. But that you know what I thought perfect. of? When that happened, I thought about the start of the game. I thought about the, the automatic decision to defer to the second half. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, okay, you're a team that gets behind – that when you get behind, you're cooked. Right, yeah. and you've had bad starts on defense. Believe it or not, there are metrics that would tell you the Patriots' defense has gotten off to worse starts than their offense. I think it's just more glaring when you look at an offense, and it's easy to see where there's production. But look at that opening drive yesterday: two of seven of seven down the field, bam, touchdown right out of the gate. I mm -hmm. thought of that. I thought of that, and then I thought about the Patriots not going for it with a minute and eight seconds left to go in the half when they had the chance to do what they always like to do, which is the double score. Down 10 points. It was 17-7. They were already down 10 points in that game. They were previously down 14 points, and they decide not to just go for it. I thought it was too conservative. I don't think that they can afford that in this game, but I also think that they should really put a focus on trying to get out to a lead. And maybe that means taking the ball first, okay? <laughs> maybe that means trying to do damage on the ground in Buffalo in setting the tone early. I thought one of the things the Patriots did so well in that first game in Buffalo when they ran the ball early, they were smacking guys in the mouth. I mean, they came out and they played oh, physical. Yeah. And, I, and I think the bread and butter of this Patriots team, you know, to come out with victories, I think it's really the same thing for them every year. And, and David Andrews has talked about this with us on our show. He said, we think we're built to play physical football. And that's what we want to do. We, we want to just go out there and physically beat other teams down. So they've got to do that from the jump. They've got to be physical. They've got to set a tone early. They've got to sort of impose their will on the Bills. And if it's cold, that's going to help the Patriots. But in addition to that, they cannot have the penalties. They cannot have the turnovers. Uh, what's their margin for error on turnovers? This is something I've been debating a little bit in recent days. I think it's one. Anything more than a turnover, they will not win the game. I meant to look some of that up today to see how that went in the turnover differential this year. Uh, maybe I'll have a little something for you on that on the show tomorrow. But – um, yeah, got to take care of the football, got to play discipline, can't let the crowd impact them. And honestly, I would run the ball down their throat again up there. Mm -hmm. I would run until you can't run. <laughs> yep. Okay? Yep. Don't try and get – don't get fancy. Stick to what you know has worked against them. Use it until it doesn't work. All of those things. All right. Before you go – before we let you go, Mark, I have two questions for you. Um, first is – What's your prediction for, for the game on Saturday? I'm going to go uh, I'm gonna go low scoring, and I'm going to go 23-20 uh, Patriots. That's what I'm going to go. Ooh, Ooh okay. And uh, my, okay. my other question is non-Patriot related. What the fuck is wrong with the Celtics? <laughs> <laughs> how, much, how much time you got? <laughs> I don't know. Give us maybe a two minutes spill on on what's going on with that. Well, here's what I know is right about the Celtics. And that is the two J's. And I've I've become more like dug in on this point, which is 
They cannot trade either one of those guys. I am digging in on this. The more I hear more about trading one of those guys, the more I'm in the camp of no effing way. You cannot trade one of those guys. They're your two best pieces. They're young. You've got to see that through. You cannot get anxious and blow that duo up because of all the other mistakes that the Celtics have made over the years, whether it's Kyrie or it's Kemba. No, you cannot, you can't pay for that and make those mistakes worse by breaking up your two best players on your roster. And so I think it's in other parts of the roster. I think they've had a lot of changeover. I think that they've got a first year rookie head coach who's still finding his way. And I, I just think, I just think beyond the two top guys and maybe, you know, Robert Williams, they're, they're just not that good. <laughs> they're, they're not as good as people think they are, you know, and, and they don't, they're not, they also don't have their clear cut leader. It should be Brown. It should be Tatum. It should be one of those guys. And I don't know that either one has emerged to sort of take the reins. I think Mike, there might be guys that look at Tatum as the guy. There are other guys that follow Brown. They don't, they don't have their guy. And I'm not giving up on the chance for that to develop. I'd give it, I'd give it more years. I'd give it multiple years to see where it goes. I'm not breaking that thing up. Uh, um, I think Barry's going to have the last question. I just want to comment on, I think their, their, their leader should be Brown. And I think he has the, um, the personality for it. I just don't think um, Smart is going to let that happen. Because, you know, they butt head all the time. So Yeah, he I might think, have to go. Yeah. Like Marcus Smart yeah. might be the guy who gets yeah. right. Smart needs to go. <laughs> that's, my, that's my stand on it. Like, Smart needs to go. Yeah, he's a pretty strong personality. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and so if you're trying to look at those other two guys and have one of them emerge as the strong personality, you know, you might have some addition by subtraction there, just in terms of the dynamic of the room, I, not how good they are on the court. You might even take a step back as a team, you might get worse as a team on the court because you've moved on from Marcus Smart, but in the long term, maybe it pays off. Yeah, Barry, yeah. Still cool, cool, sounds good. Um. I was just gonna ask. So, I you know listen to a lot, a lot, a lot of the show, and I'm a you know big fan of the show. Uh, you know, l l listen every day whenever I get the chance. I want to know what's your favorite behind the scenes moment with 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 Zolak that you've had in your time working with him on Zolak and Bertrand. Oh, behind the scenes moment. Oh, I'm trying to think. <laughs> Um, oh man, there are a few. I, I just remember, I know what it is. I know what it is. Uh, I, I, I would say this, our entire trip to the Super Bowl in Houston, Super Bowl 51, the big comeback against the Falcons. Mm -hmm. We had, we had, a, I would say it's not necessarily one moment, although I can share some of those moments, but yeah, that I, entire was... week, that entire week, our whole show was there and we had a great sort of experience as a group, you know, all, all uh, was four of us it was me, Zoe, Hardy and Jim Lau, who is now one of our bosses. But that entire week was a, an awesome week. And I'll never forget. <laughs> we, uh, we had, you know, we went to the Barstool sports party, which Zoe and I have talked about on the air before. And that was a really weird and fun time. And uh, we, Zoe, Wrote a bowl and dressed in a full cowboy outfit that week, and you know, like that was That's ridiculous. Awesome. Yeah, but one of the, one of the um, one of the like most ridiculous things was that we went to NASA, mm. and so we got this great mm. private tour of NASA, and we went around, and you know, we got to look at we got to look at everything. I mean, we got this great behind the scenes access. We had a listener new people at NASA and they, you know, we did background checks. Like we really got hooked up. We, we got, we got clearance. We were in and I'll, and I'll never forget that uh, we were, <laughs> we were touring NASA and we met probably a half a dozen astronauts along the way uh, that we got to talk to. It wasn't just, Hey, how you doing? It was, you know, we had one astronaut with us that stayed with us the whole time we were there. Oh, wow. Yeah. The wow, whole time we were awesome. there, he, he was show. Yeah. And he, you know, we were talking to him, the whole time and, and at one point 
that astronaut, you know, had a couple of others that came up and we were inside like a hangar type of facility. And we are going through like, what is the, the, the junk drawer at NASA? It's all these like decommissioned spaceships. And we're, you know, we're going in this capsule and we're going in this cat and we're going like, oh, did we use this? Uh, this was a machine we want to bring to Mars. And like, we're looking at all this stuff. And Zoe corners, he corners like three astronauts and wants to know, uh, he said, uh, you know, can you, can you tell me about the aliens? Can you, can you tell me what you know about them? <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> And like without even without even a hint of sarcasm, he's like, um, "Yeah, so what about them? You know, what what do you got on the aliens?" And they're like, "What?" <laughs> and he's like, "Well, listen. I mean, this is what he tells." And now, granted, these guys have all been to space. One guy we met had just come back like two weeks earlier. He had just spent six, I think, it was six months on yeah. the International Space Station, right? So if there were aliens, you know, that have visited, these guys would probably be the ones to see it. Not who Zoe referenced, which is he sells, he tells them, you know, I used to play football and the pilots that used to fly our planes and chartered our flights, they told me they saw some things. So uh, what do you know about it? <laughs> and Hardy and I are just like, this guy is not even kidding right now. <laughs> not even kidding a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, man. and they're like, uh, okay. And then as soon as that conversation ended where they were like, yeah, we, we haven't seen anything. Sorry. So was like, all right, I got to go get a bag of chips. He went searching, <laughs> he went searching <laughs> and somehow, some way he found a vending machine in that hangar in NASA where he found a bag of chips. I, oh, I, I kid you what? not. <laughs> and that's just like uh, a day in the life of Zoe. Typical you know? Yeah. All right, I gotta get a bag of chips. Oh, right, I'll be back. Legend. I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely, oh. man. That guy's he's one of a kind for sure. He, he he's he's different, but you're right, definitely legendary for sure. He he's a real one. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh. awesome, man. Thank you so much for sharing that uh, story with us. We appreciate that. That was great. <laughs> No problem, man. Well, Mark, it's been a pleasure having you on. Seriously, man. You know, we, we loved having you on. Uh, great conversation for sure. And um, hopefully you get over, you know, your situation um, as soon as possible, man. So uh, we'll be tuning in 10 to 2 p.m. 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. daily. We, need, and so we right. need everybody to get out of their houses again. Everyone's got to get out of quarantine. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Get this pandemic over with. Yes, absolutely. No, definitely need to get back to a uh, normal life, a normal way of living. Yeah, I agree. I, absolutely, yeah. man. We thought we were getting there, and we're not, but hopefully soon. Yes, you know? sir. Hope so, man. Hope so. Well, guys, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you for time, man. Have a good evening. All right. Take it right, easy. Right, right. Yeah, definitely love to have you back on sometime for sure. This was awesome. You this, you know where to find this, me. This was really a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. All right, guys. Thanks. All right, have a good night. All right. Sounds See good. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Take care. Wow. There it was, huh? There it was. was. Awesome. I really, I really, so really, like your trade. Yeah, really like Mark. So I, I really, really enjoyed talking to Mark. Yeah, I, I can tell, lad. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've, I've been a fan of him since you know he was part of, um, like I said, um, um, My, Felger and Maz. Felger and Maz when he yeah. wasn't even he wasn't even big time yet. And I just thought that he was always like he always had good take, you know. Yeah. 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 yeah absolutely. Me. You know, I mean, we, we love talking to the guys that know the game, and he's he's one of those guys, man, that just knows it inside and out. And yeah. um, he, he does that really good take, and, you know, he takes the job seriously. So He's not afraid know. to speak his mind as either. Absolutely, man. We appreciate yeah, definitely. it. Definitely. And, you know, like we said on the show, make sure you follow Mark Bertrand. It's Mark with a C underscore Bertrand on Twitter, you know. Um, he got a lot of good content there. 
and make sure you're listening to them every day, weekday, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on 98.5, the Sports Hub, man. That, that's where he's at. Um, you know, that's why he's so great. So if you're still listening, right. sure you're also subscribing to the show, following us on social media. We're at ProFan Sports on everything except for Instagram, and that's ProFans underscore sports. So waiting for y'all, man. So until next time, thanks for tuning in. We out. Have a good week, everyone. See y'all next week. We're on episode 95.